Hi, I'm B for Next Mechanics, and in today's video, I'm going to show you the techniques and tips and tricks that I've learned along the years to help you create your very own Blender Transformer. So unfortunately, this tutorial is not going to be the most beginner friendly. We're talking about a lot of nerdy stuff here, so I'm going to require you to have already made a donut or two in the past. I've got two years worth of Blender technical knowledge to share, and I'm putting it in one video. No matter what I do, it's probably going to overload you, so just make sure to go at your own pace, watch it a couple times if you need to, and let's enjoy the show! So to start with, we're going to need reference images. For me, I'm using the 80s Bumblebee as my reference, so I'm going to go across various casting episodes, get as many screenshots as I can from as many different angles. Ideally, we want images that are what is called orthographic view, and what that means is it has no perspective. So now that we have our reference images, we can import those into our Blender scene by hitting Shift A, click on Image, and then Reference. From there, we can have our images floating around Tony Stark style, and we can put them where we need in the scene. Now, like I was saying, the orthographic views are great for straight on views, we could almost kind of trace them as we're modeling. The rest, I'm just going to put to one side and glance at as I need. So now we're just going to start modeling our vehicle. I'm trying to follow the reference image as best as I can. Like I say, the multiple angles give you a better idea of what the shapes actually are. If you only have the front on views, you can get a very squished, messed up looking vehicle very quick. Now transformer models, no matter what you do, are going to be a bit laggy. So to minimize that, we're going to keep our topology very, very simple. We're only going to have the vertices we need. So to make it not look terrible, we're going to make sure we right click our object and select Shade Smooth. That way our mesh is pretty basic, but it still looks appealing. And this is probably a bit too basic for most people watching this, but make sure you add the mirror modifier. It'll save you so much time. Now from here, you just keep modeling until you're happy with the result. Now, you can choose how close you stick to the reference. For me, I want to go super, super 80s, so my Bumblebee is going to be a straight up penny racer vehicle because I love that aesthetic. Seeing as the 80s cartoon's wheels don't have rims, I don't actually have to animate them spinning because there's no details to show that, which again, it's going to save us a lot of time later on. So we've got our alt mode, whatever that may be, boombox car jet. Now it's time to shade it. Now, this is where we start going to the specifics of doing 80s Transformer shading. They were always hand-drawn cell animation characters. So to emulate that style in Blender, we're going to do some funky material node setups. First off, we're going to select our object and we're going to hit New Material. Now we're going to hit the Material tab at the top. Delete your principal BSDF, we don't need that. Instead, we want a diffuse BSDF connected to a shader RGB, which is then connected to a color ramp, and finally the material output. The color ramp we can then change to constant, so we don't get any blending of the colors. I tried to use three colors in my ramps, a dark, a main color, and a highlight, and then we can adjust the sliders to get it interacting how we want with the light. Then for any other colors that I make, I can just copy paste these material nodes into a new material and change the colors in it. If you have things like the car body, which is only one object, but it needs multiple colors, you can very easily sort that. You make sure there is multiple materials on that object, then you go into edit mode, select say the windows in my example, click the windows material you've made and just hit assign. Now you have one object with multiple colors and you can do this for as many as you need. And because our topology has been fairly basic, we don't have to worry about doing any fancy material mapping or anything like that. We can just select the faces we need and it'll work. Okay, finally, before we move on to making the robot mode, we need some line art. It looks a bit sort of flat right now and we can't really understand the shape very easily. So we're gonna make sure all of our car is in a collection and then we're going to hit Shift A, Grease Pencil, and then make sure it's set to collection. We can then make sure that it is targeting the car collection. And now it's generating line art real time off of the camera view. You'll find when you're viewing it in the 3D space that the lines look kind of weird at first. And I remember when I first used it, I was so confused why I could see the front of the car on the back. It's because it's projecting it off of the current active camera. If you hit zero on your number pad and go into the camera view, it should look absolutely perfect. Now, 
Grease Pencil, because it's generating it real time, is gonna be laggy. So to minimize that, we're actually gonna make a second collection, which we're going to use just for the Grease Pencil. We'll put the Grease Pencil in that collection, and then that collection can go in the car collection. How many times could I say collection in one sentence? The reason we're doing this is because if you disable the view of Grease Pencil in your menu, it's still actually generating it behind the scenes. It's not gonna stop your computer lagging. If you put it in a collection and then you disable that collection, it actually stops it instead of just stopping you viewing it. I wish I had known this when I first started, so that's why I'm putting it in this video. So, you've made your alt mode. You've got cool shading, you've got your line art, you've got your glowy lights. It's time for the fun part, the robot mode. The first step we're gonna do is actually duplicate our car collection model. We want a backup, obviously, but also sometimes we only need the alt mode for an animation. So having a more simple model that doesn't have a load of robot parts is great to have on hand. Now we can go into edit mode and start cutting our vehicle mode up into a bunch of chunks. Transformers obviously have those kibble parts, so we want to slice up our vehicle to make those kibble. We can just select the chunk that we want, hit P, and then separate by selection. This is why having good topology is crucial, because you can just follow those edge lines as you need. Now that we've cut up all of the car, we can start turning it into a robot. Now, before we start moving all of the car parts into the robot position, we're gonna do a trick that I learned from Glitchbox, whose video I'll link down in the description below, where we actually save location and rotation keyframes of all of the parts before we move it. I used to do it a jank way, where I would have a bunch of copies of the file and sort of like squish him back into the car mode, and that worked, but they never lined up perfectly. This lets Blender remember where all the car parts were supposed to be in car mode before we transform it. Now we can go to frame 20, start moving all the car parts to match our reference images, and then we can add another location and rotation keyframe. So now the car parts are in car mode on frame zero and in robot mode on frame 20. Then if we use this file for any other actual animations, we can just slide those keyframes or duplicate them as we need. Okay, so the car mode is sliced up and all of the parts are moved where we want, so it's time to start modeling the unique robot parts. Much like the car modeling, this just involves following our reference, and you can follow it as close as you do or don't want to do. We're just trying to make a model that's aesthetically pleasing and will work. Again, it doesn't have to actually work, it just has to look like it works. That's why I add things like cylinders on its side for all of his knees and elbows. It kind of looks like a hinge I do in one of my 3D prints, but doesn't actually need to do anything. Another thing I do is I make it so that every major component, upper arm, forearm, waist, neck, head, they're all almost sort of like chunks. Now, you'll see why when we go to rig him later, but just keep that in mind. Before we rig him, we need to give him a mouth. Now, Bumblebee doesn't have a mouth modeled here, and it's not because I'm doing a Bayverse reference. <laughs> Where, to give it that classic animation feel, we're actually going to draw each of the mouths as individual frames. This is a technique that I got from Southern Shotty, and his video is probably going to explain it better than me, but I'll try my best, and again, I'll link him down below. So we're going to go into a digital drawing software of your choice. For me, I'm using Procreate, but it doesn't really matter what you use. As long as it can export to a PNG, it's going to work. So now I draw a bunch of different mouth shapes. These are called phenome shapes, and they're basically, you know, the mouth shapes you make when you talk. The more, the better, but you just want your key shapes. Ooh, ah, yee. I like a muppet. I, I... Now we can export them as a PNG with a transparent background. I then save all of them to one folder on my machine, and I make sure to label them with numbers on the end in the order that I want. The reason we number this is because of how we're going to import it into Blender, which we can now go do. So we go into Blender and we import our first image as a mesh plane. Then we go into the shading tab and select the folder icon on our image texture. Then we can shift select the entire list of mouths and hit open image. This then turns our material into an image sequence. We make sure the start frame is 1, the offset is 0, cyclic needs to be enabled, and make sure auto refresh is also enabled. You may find that the images don't stand out too well, so I add a principal BSDF on the end of that and turn the roughness all the way up. Now, we want to be able to animate these mouths, so we're going to add an armature bone. 
If we go into pose mode and move it up, that shows the Y location moving. If we right click that, we can then select copy as new driver. Then going back into the shading menu, we can right click our offset and choose add driver. Now when I move the bone up in pose mode, it changes the pictures it shows. And of course you can keyframe the bone, so we can now animate the mouth, but we have to move it quite a lot for it to actually do anything. So to minimize that, we can add a scripted expression, which means that we have to move the bone less to actually make it change the picture. So we make sure we have an input variable, which corresponds to the driver. We then name that in my case, BB mouth. Then in our scripted expression, we can type ABS, open bracket, BB mouth, asterisk 10, close bracket, close bracket. This basically tells the software that every time we move the bone, it's the equivalent of moving it 10 times the distance we have actually moved it. This means we don't have to shove the bone all the way in the sky just to get him to grin. So finally, we could hit edit mode on our image mesh, subdivide it a few times, and then add a shrink wrap modifier. We can then target our face mesh so it will actually stretch it all around it nicely, and then we can parent it to that face mesh. That means we now have a mouth that we can animate as we so wish, and it's actually gonna move with the head. Ta-da! He can speak! I did warn you it was gonna be nerdy. <laughs> um, I'll make sure that I link to Southern Shoddy's video because he explains it a little bit better than I do, but this is just to get you started. Before we start rigging, if you wanna give him some unique facial expressions, you can select his helmet, or whatever your head of the character is, and add some shape keys. Shape keys are basically Blender having an object that remembers multiple states, if that makes sense. So the basis is like the first object we made, but if we add a shape key, we can then go into edit mode, re-stretch all the vertices how we want. So in this case, I'm, you know, giving them a furrowed brow or shocked eyebrows or whatever it is with the helmet. And then we have a slider that lets it move the verts as we so wish and animate with it. And now we have a bumblebee that can be all angry Happy, shocked, sad, it's really useful. Okay, finally we can rip this guy, it took us long enough. Now, we're not gonna be doing any weight painting, don't worry. We are going to actually parent the objects to bones. You know how I said that I try and keep it as chunks? Yeah, this is when it comes into play. So for things like his head, we'll make sure his face and his eyes, which are separate objects, are parented to his helmet. Then we can parent the object to the head bone, and now we have a head that can move as I so wish. And we'll do the same for every major chunk. Now to help animating later on, I wanna add some basic inverse kinematics to it. For those that don't know, inverse kinematics basically lets me move the skeleton like it's a puppet. I can grab just the hand and it will move the rest of the arm with it instead of just the hand moving. To do that, we're gonna go into the armature and we're gonna hit edit. And we're going to add an extra bone at his heel and an extra bone at his knee. They're going to be facing opposite directions. Make sure you disconnect and unparent these bones because if you don't, your leg is going to spin like a fairy go round. It's, it's not ideal. Now we're going to go into pose mode. We're going to select our heel, shift select the lower leg bone and hit shift I. This will let us add the inverse kinematics bone constraint a lot quicker and easier and we can then choose our pole target to be that knee bone. What this basically means is if I grab that heel and move it up, the leg is gonna bend like a, like a leg, but the heel doesn't know where the front and back is, so that's where the knee pole bone goes. You might find that you need to do some extra tweaks, like making sure the chain length is set to two, so it will actually move how you want. Sometimes they get confused about rotation and you have to tweak that, but these are fairly minor. So let's make sure all of the robot parts have keyframes of their own. We'll save where they are on frame 20 so all the robot mode section is complete and we'll now shove them forcibly back into the car mode on frame zero. You're probably gonna have to add some extra keyframes here and there because the robot parts are just gonna slide through everything and make a mess. So you're gonna have to manually tweak that. And again, if parts aren't behaving themselves, shape keys are your friend. It will move it without actually moving the object. That makes sense. The final step for that classic animation feel is to use Southern Shoddy's Stopmo add-on, which again, I'll link below. It means that your animation has a stepped modifier applied to it, so it moves kind of stuttery like Spider-Verse or classic animation. I tend to only add it so that it applies two steps, 
but you can add three, four, five, however much of a choppiness look you want to add to it, you can choose. So you've done it. You've made your very own Blender Transformer model. It took a lot of work, but now it's yours and it was well worth it in my opinion. My final tip for animating transformations is if your character is going to transform multiple times in one render, like I did for Bumblebee here, make sure you duplicate your keyframes instead of copy paste for when you want to turn back into a car. I don't know why, but copy paste makes them explode, but duplicate makes them slide perfectly back in. Otherwise, I hope this has helped get you started. I know it's a lot to take in in one go, so if you've got any questions, feel free to comment down below. And of course, I'll make sure that Southern Shoddy and Glitchbox get linked in the description below because they were big help. Otherwise, if you liked what you saw and you want to see more, feel free to subscribe, and I'll catch you next time. Farewell!